leadership development and startups so that you become yourself self-employed. China is really amazing because Chinese have been able to reduce their poverty level. There are hundreds of things which Dr. Kalam has come out. Times the word uh, ecosystem was mentioned, innovation ecosystem. So scheduling of scheduling of this session, which is uh, aimed to explore the India uh, innovation ecosystem from an Indian perspective, I think it's very relevant and very apt. Uh, we have uh, a eminent panel of uh, speakers that are going to participate in this session. Um, and what I would do is I would first invite them to the dais and then I would uh, uh, put my opening remarks and then in, in invite the speakers to, uh, to present. So first and foremost, it's my privilege and pleasure to invite Sri Sudhir Kumar Mishra. He is the CEO and Managing Director of uh, Brahmos Airspace. <laughs> Brahmos Air, Aerospace is a wonderful example of uh, a cross across the country collaboration across the country collaboration that has that has that has produced and is producing amazing results and we are really privileged to have him and you know we are really looking forward to hear his perspective on uh, the ecosystem from a vantage of someone who is uh, who is managing two countries two governments uh, all the complexities thereof welcome mr mishra Next, I want to invite Mr. Anil Sinha. Mr. Sinha, he is a strategic advisor, Millennium Alliance, and we heard about what Millennium Alliance does uh, in the former session. He is uh, also the former regional head of Inclusive Business South, East, South Asia of the World Bank Group. And you know, we, are, we, are, we would look forward to hearing his perspective on an ecosystem from a uh, from a uh, vantage point of something to have you know, around inclusive business. How does uh, making things inclusive, uh, what kind of ecosystem challenges that presents and we hope to hear from you your experience India and South Asia. Let's welcome Mr. Sin. Next I want to uh, invite Dr. Selvamurthy who is uh, president of Amiti Science Technology Innovations Foundation. And uh, Dr. Selvamurthy brings a, he was formerly with DRDO, and uh, uh, you know, from DRDO he's done amazing things and he continues to do so at Amiti now. Uh, just before coming over here in the break, I had a chance to um, look at the, their, their uh, booth, Amiti's booth. I would strongly suggest everybody should, should take a walk through. I mean, I was zapped to, I was really zapped. I mean, this is a, a Indian um, university and we, we complain about Indian universities not producing um, innovations, but this is an Indian university that has, in a very short span, what, 10 years, uh, 600 patents? 680 patents. 680 patents. I think, I think we must give, give them a great help, yeah? So what Mr. Sel Selvamurthy brings to this uh, forum is his experience in DRDO from a government publicly funded uh, organization, which again has produced very, very tangible results for India. And now he, is, he has been with uh, Amity, uh, essentially in a startup mode, I think. I think you joined them when they were starting up. So from a university perspective, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities uh, that are uh, present uh, as far as the innovation ecosystem is concerned? <laughs> Last but not least, I want to invite Dr. Vijay Mahajan. Dr. Vijay Mahajan, he is John Harbin Centen Centennial Chair in Business, <laughs> Macomb School of Business, the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Vijay. Uh, as again you heard this morning, uh, University of Texas has played a key role in um, helping uh, uh, the India, uh, India growth program in terms of commercialization of the technologies. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahajan is, a, I believe, as an engineer by training originally. Yes. And then he moved on to business side of things. So I think he, 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 he brings again a very unique perspective he spent some his formative years in India, and then I, he told me that he's gone abroad. Was 
we are we invent, but we are not able to convert those inventions into practice. So that's where processes and policies uh, come into being. Um, and 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 for for uh, a thriving innovation ecosystem, I think all three buckets have to go move have to grow hand in hand. Uh, we within Reliance are trying to do some of that. Uh, obviously, in an organization, although as large as it is, it is a little easier to do because a lot of things is what you can control, what you can better define. In, in a country, uh, it's, it's little more challenging, it's much more challenging. But we believe that the three buckets are also very relevant when you're looking at a countrywide innovation ecosystem. And that's what I am hopeful that we will be able to hear uh, from our speakers today. So without, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Mishra uh, to share his perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chief Controller, uh, Research and Development in uh, DRDO. And uh, I'm also uh, CEO and MD of uh, Brimhose Aerospace uh, Private Limited. And uh, I have done my education from uh, uh, Engineering College Jabalpur, uh, IIT Madras, and uh, NIT Warangal. And uh, here today, uh, I have a privilege to kickstart discussion on uh, innovation, ecosystems, and uh, international cooperations. Uh, friends, uh, as uh, has been said many times, that uh, uh, innovation is the result of uh, a small or a big idea. And uh, the idea can happen anytime, at any place. Uh, the Brahmos Aerospace is also a result of an idea. It was a result of a visit, a visit of uh, a, a great personality. We all know uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, he was visiting Moscow, Russia, regarding some other business. And uh, just uh, uh, by fluke, he said, I want to go out. Uh, it's too suffocating. I would like to have a walk. And uh, director general of the institute where he was visiting, he said, uh, let me take you to a place uh, which has never seen the light of the day, but it's having the great potential. He said, OK, let's go. And uh, he was shown a. A, an, an engine, a ramjet engine, uh, which was uh, half completed. It happened in the 1990s. And uh, all of you know that uh, Soviet Union imploded. And uh, although India didn't implode, but we were almost busted as far as the economy is concerned. Uh, the young guys may not be knowing, but uh, we had to uh, deposit all our gold in Bank of England to sustain our economy, to get to buy gas and oil. And uh, when both the economies are down, and uh, the idea germinated in the great mind, and uh, Dr. Kalam said, yes, uh, we can do something. And uh, how can we do something? Uh, this is a story which I would be telling you shortly. We decided. Uh, Dr. Kalam and his counterpart, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Yefremov. He is pretty old man in 90s. He still comes to the office. He works. He doesn't interfere into the day-to-day -day functioning of the R&D Institute. But he <coughs> comes out with the idea. He shares it with the, the present leadership. And uh, he tells them that uh, this is a workable, this is practical, this will happen after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So he's a great mind. So one takeaway is great minds can work at any age. They need not retire at the age of 60 as it happens in our country. First, I would like to tell you, or rather share with you, uh, what is required for innovation. The most important thing is uh, a technology. A technology which is having potential to grow, which is having potential to be put to a purpose for small, medium, or long term, and uh, where we can 
bring enhancement over a period of time. This is what happened with Brahmos. When everybody else was thinking about subsonic engine to propel a missile, we started with a supersonic engine. So we were, in the very beginning, we, will, we were a cut above than rest of the world. And uh, here, because I named, I, I named the word world, so I would like to tell to the audience that Dramos is the best missile in the world. It is uh, having no competition for another five to 10 years. And when we will have competition, then we would have moved to the next level, that is uh, hypersonic. So this is the plan. And uh, coming, to, coming back to, again to the technology, we planned that we will make a missile around this engine and uh, we will make a model in such a manner that the model is able to sustain uh, for 20, 30, 40 years. And uh, we decided that we will take the engine this would be the main uh, idea and around which we will put the flesh. Indian side would do some things, Russians would do something and uh, we had, uh, we didn't have uh, great plans for the future, how the whole thing will take shape. But we knew that this is a great idea. So my emphasis is on the idea. The idea has to be great, it must have potential and it must have the users which may happen, uh, you may start with uh, one group of users, but they may uh, spread to a wider uh, users. I would come back to that. The second thing is about the finance. Uh, nothing can be done without money. And uh, in the Brahmos, when the both countries were almost bankrupt, we decided that we will uh, create an equity and uh, the Russian side debt would be converted to equity from the Indian side. And we started with a 250 million US dollar. We told each other very clearly that money would not come upfront onto the table. It will, it will come in the form of trenches. And uh, so we started, in fact, with very few thousands of dollars in our hand. But the equity was promised that this would be this much, 250 million US dollars, which later on was increased to 300 million US dollars because we wanted to uh, include Air Force also as our users. Now, the first idea of uh, very innovative financial engineering was to get the equity, convert debt into the equity. The second was, if suppose, uh, we make it 50-50%, uh, then uh, legally it's not viable. There has to be something uh, which will you know, bring it a majority stakeholder. And uh, Russian side said, we don't want it to be owned by government of India. And government of India was a view that uh, it should not, uh, we should have a majority stakeholders. And uh, we always feel, uh, let's make it 51-49. The again key, Problem was, the moment we make it a 51% by government of India, it becomes a defense public sector undertaking. So we are into a big problem. And uh, you know, one, uh, we call most of the bureaucrats as a babu. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it's a uh, defamatory word, sometimes it is a affectionate word. People perceive the meaning from their own point of view. But uh, one bureaucrat, he said, uh, let's make it a 50.5. Nobody will own it. Government of India would have a majority and uh, it would be a private company because private, of, private company gives a lot of autonomy. I don't need to emphasize it more there. Coming to the, the skill and knowledgeable manpower. I want to tell you that uh, in this country, if you want to do anything in the area of defense, then there is only one defense technology generator. It's DRDO much abused, much appreciated, and much dependent on at the time of emergency or at the time of uh, when you have uh, nothing to depend on. So DRDO is the main technology generator in the country. And DRDO said, we will hold your hand. We will generate the technology from Indian side. And uh, technology is related to 
guidance, navigation, controls, airframes, ground support systems, control system, fire control systems, all the ground support systems, they were completely indigenously made by DRDO for BrahMos. And uh, rest of the technologies, they came from Russia. And uh, I want to tell you that the technology and uh, revenue generation model is also based on 50-50. Uh, it's not that uh, uh, one uh, stakeholder can take away all the money. It's not so. So we decided in the very beginning that 50% of the revenue will be Russian, 50% would be with Indians. And technology, uh, technology proportion also would be like that. Uh, I don't have a watch. Just tell me when I'm, okay. I have to finish. Okay, yeah. yeah. I so I can... Okay, done. Good. So we decided we had a great uh, partner in the DRDO and NPOM. But Brumhos also needed to develop uh, their own manpower. We decided we will go for campus recruitment only to NIT, uh, not to IIT, not to any other colleges, but only to NIT because the engineers who come out of NIT, they would stay with us. And... Uh, <laughs> We decided a few more things that we would not go to a particular region. We would have a cross uh, uh, selection from all over the country. So right from Silchar to Nagpur, right from uh, Himachal Pradesh to Kerala, we went all the way to recruit the guys. In the last batch, no two guys were able to speak in their own mother tongue. So this is the kind of you know, cross uh, recruitment we carried out. We feel that uh, this brings a kind of very heterogeneous atmosphere and uh, people come out with uh, you know, uh, the great idea and uh, they are able to share it. They bring a lot of different kind of thinkings. And uh, coming to a very important thing for a, uh, a business to succeed is the networking. Uh, our users are mostly defense services, Indian Army, Navy, Air Force, security system, national security advisor, DRDO. So we decided that uh, the board of directors would be from uh, DRDO and Ministry of Defense. So this gives uh, a kind of networking inroads into the stakeholders. And uh, as a CEO and MD, I bring uh, onto the table more than 32 years of experience. And uh, I can walk into NSA room, defense minister room, PMO at any place, defense secretary, any of the secretary. So what I want to tell you that you need to have a stakeholder who, has, who is having reached to almost all the top echelon of the, uh, your, uh, your users, stakeholders. The next thing is any idea is having a timeline. It's having a life cycle. So we started with a, a supersonic cruise missile. Our users were only Indian Navy. And uh, we thought that let's bring a capability enhancement over a period of time. And uh, initially, the missile was uh, anti-ship. When we became very successful, then Indian Army showed little bit of interest. When they showed interest, we know that there is a, everybody know that there is a difference in the a uh, ship target and a stationary target. We decided, okay, uh, we would bring lot many changes in our missile system and uh, we would make it, we would uh, uh, completely customize it to meet the requirement of Indian Army. And we did it. And uh, that's how, uh, when we started, our order values were uh, only about uh, 20, 22 million US dollars. But uh, when Indian Army came, then the order value went into hundreds of uh, millions of US dollars. And uh, we got order for one regiment. They said come out with a surgical strike capability. The surgical strike capability is something like in a village or in a city, if you want to take on a target, the target should be, a, our my missile should be intelligent enough to differentiate the target and should be able to hit where it is intended to. So we brought a capability and uh, we told to the government, today, if you want to decide that uh, a particular terrorist has to be taken, 
So we provide you capability. You can go. I can take my missile through the window, hit the house, and take on him. The second was there were threats in the northeast. They said we want a missile which should have a uh, a mount, a kind of uh, capability where we can reach beyond the mountains. So we brought a, uh, a steep dive capability to the missile. Now. We brought the capability up to about 65, 70 degree. Now there are requirements which are calling for a vertical steep dive capability. Please imagine uh, a supersonic cruise missile is like an unmanned aircraft. It's moving at the supersonic speed. That is almost three mark. And you want to bring it vertical, take on the target. I leave it to the audience to think about the complexities involved. One minute, yeah. And uh, we again extended the capabilities to Indian Air Force. Su-30 launching a BrahMos missile, which is having a range of 300 kilometers. Su-30 ranges 3,500 kilometers. Please add, you refuel it, add another 3,500 kilometers. So it is 7,000 kilometers. It's 7,000 kilometers capability with a standoff distance of 300 kilometers. There's something which a pilot, which a Indian Air Force, or any Air Force in the world dream to achieve. We are not sleeping. We are also thinking about the future. We are thinking to bring hypersonic capability uh, to bring it. Now, hypersonic technology is something which is quite unknown to everybody in the world. Uh, what you read in the newspaper is basically hypersonic capability for a intercontinental ballistic missile. There you, you provide a kind of maneuverability at the hypersonic speed to the re-entry target. But I'm talking about hypersonic speed to an aircraft, to a supersonic, uh, to a cruise missile, which is very different than a incoming ballistic missile. For that, we started the work. We are already started the work in uh, different uh, educational institutes. Uh, I don't want to share because the institutes say that you don't publicly declare our names. They are working in the defense. But they are certainly uh, IITs, ICs. And uh, we are doing the research at uh, Moscow Aviation Institute in Russia. And uh, we want to bring capabilities to the present engine itself so that we reach to the to the beginning of the hypersonic regime. That would be about five mark. It is easier to do the thermal management. It is easier to do some, uh, some to bring some new metallurgy to the engine and go up to the five. But beyond five, it's not possible. We have to come out with an entirely different technology, a new physics, a new aerodynamics, new materials, new electronics. Uh, and I want to tell audience, none of the technology exists as on today. Uh, we are doing all the studies in the laboratory, but we feel that something would happen after five years, seven years. So these are the various uh, domain, these are the various factors, various uh, elements uh, by which you can bring innovation, by which, uh, which uh, all the scientists, all the people, innovators, they should think. Uh, an idea is not everything. You need uh, finance, you need uh, people, you need uh, uh, networking, you need uh, users, and uh, you need support of your, uh, if possible, your users. Uh, Facebook has support of uh, the social network users. Brahmos has support of government of India and government of Russia. So these all things make your idea click. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Fascinating uh, story, and uh, you know, I I can see a lot of lessons for a startup. Uh, so what the Brahmos did, I think they could apply to a startup. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madhuri. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure for me to be here. I'll speak on behalf of the Million Alliance. Uh, I chair the Strategic Advisory Board, which is a wiki managed uh, program, uh, basically to capture innovations in last mile delivery of social services and scale them up. As you've heard, ideas are plenty. How do you capture them and scale them? And for me, and Millennium Lines, the interest is, how do you do that for the underserved? And we're doing this in partnership with international organizations, so that's the theme of the topic here also. Uh, so the members of the Millennium Alliance 
clients include USAID, DFID of UK, ECO of the Netherlands, and Indian institutions such as the Yes Bank Institute and others. Uh, the whole idea is to see crowdsource these innovations and then support them. Uh, so we run a competition for this, and we're looking at different sectors. But I think what we discussed today is how do we all look at this ecosystem? And I think it's important to agree on what an ecosystem development program would look like. Um, and I'm going back to really what the monetary inclusive markets use as a framework for their uh, famous uh, uh, book on blueprint to scale. Because that's what we're talking about, for blueprint to scale, what does that mean? And the ecosystem therein uh, for social enterprises, for last time delivery, have really four elements, much of which has been alluded to by both these speakers uh, before me. One is at the innovator level. What do you do to at the enterprise or the innovator level? What do you need to do in terms of the policy level to create, create an enabling environment? But two other aspects are important, both in terms of the value chain, uh, market access, in other words, and at public goods, the infrastructure. How do all four combine to make that happen? The biggest issue quite often we hear from, from, from innovators is finance. There's a large movement developing internationally called investing investing. Investors that want their money to go into innovative enterprises to promote social good, but not a commercial business-like manner. Uh, in addition to MA, uh, after retiring from the World Bank after 23 years, I also represent the Global Impact Investors Network. 200 financial institutions and development organizations looking at how their money can be used better to do good. The big issue is, of course, the risk. <coughs> how do we mitigate against the risk of, of and there a number of financial instruments are coming in, in terms of guarantee programs. Uh, USA has been running this globally. <coughs> the UK government is looking at a tax rate. So for a venture capitalist in investing in an innovative social venture, <coughs> if you lose your money, you get a tax rate. And therefore, you're finding that a huge amount of money is coming in to support these inventions. Um, we're also looking at policies and regulations of defining this space. So if you're doing an invention, and you can do it for social good, you can call yourself a social enterprise, you have different incentives for a social enterprise in addition to what's happening for the SME sector. Clearly, this is bringing in a new breed of people that want to do good along with the business model. And I think that's what uh, is needed. A few examples of the work that we've done, and much of it, I think, is, is captured in some of the subsector work that's uh, uh, sessions that are happening after this. And you need to look at ecosystems through different sector lenses. So what's happening in the, in the healthcare sector is different than the education sector and the agribusiness sector. You can't always cover that with a broad brush if you want to make it happen. And uh, for us, healthcare is there in the session afterwards that program, other inventions, and much of what you're seeing, the technology and the inventions that are happening in R&D labs, in defense labs, and how they can be localized for the mass market. Uh, for example, there's a phase material. Um, Chotakul was an example. This was a slow cost fridge that you could use without electricity for long hours, uh, which could be uh, for a fridge for 3,000 rupees, large corporate got behind it, um, you could, you, but it used an invention called phase material. So how, this is a jargon called you know, the, 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 the destructive engineering or, uh, or, or disruptive engineering. Using high level technology that's available in the West for creating a model that can be used for delivering basically pyramid examples. We're finding really that the policy enabling environment, I think, needs to work on that. And I think uh, the, the Atal Innovation mission of the Niti Ayog has just been published a report. It's on the website. They're looking for comments. And they're looking at how you can have innovations uh, in, in this space. India can be a leader in terms of innovations and in terms of delivery of innovative solutions for the best benefit. In the same way that the West is an inventor for the affluent. India can be the invention base for the basic business by cost-effective solutions that affect the people at the base of the benefit. How to do that, maybe I can stop here and we can come back to a further discussion on that.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sinha. I think... Uh... Mr. Chairman, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I first of all appreciate Vicky for this excellent initiative at the right time, most opportune time when we can look at how do we move fast, how do we boost our innovation capabilities, what should we do in-house, and how do we leverage the international cooperation to bring more innovation in this decade of innovation, which the government of India has declared. And also, we are now having the human resource, the talented, innovative, creative human resource. That is the first thing, which is primordial requirement for innovation. The second thing is we have built our infrastructure. If you really look at today the infrastructure, we have about 600, uh, more than 600 universities, 33,000 colleges, and uh, now we are trying to improve the quality education, particularly quality science education. That is the second thing which is required is that how do you create this manpower, the demographic advantage, which is the most creative, innovative phase of one's life is between 15 to maybe 13. Then you build on your experience and so on. So that resource is available. It's predicted in another 20 years that one in four of every scientific worker will be an Indian. Because that, that is the power, whether he's in India or abroad. So it's going to be the power. So you have that talented human resource so we need to shape them up well. So this is the first requirement when you are looking at how do you boost up innovation and you need to give high quality science education, not only at the university level, but also at the, uh, the school level, pre-nursery level. The creativity, innovation has to be seated there, not just only at the university. So now the government of India is now looking at how do we, how do we improve, rejuvenate our science education. Because today knowledge is open source. Just open the Google, you get every information what you want. So the classroom teaching and even the science education should be uh, looking for a new paradigm. That you should do it by learning. And you should learn it by doing. And also you should uh, give more projects, you should more seminars, more group discussion, more brainstorming. This, should be, this is how the science should be taught, not just only teaching the syllabus and people, perhaps the students can uh, know more than what is there, what is going to be taught in the class. So the first thing which we need to look at is that you need three entities for any innovation. First is an academia, which should be looking at seeding technologies by uh, doing basic fundamental futuristic research. So you need that entity, which is very important, universities, and also both private as well as the central universities and IITs, in the Indian Institute of Science, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So we have built that research infrastructure today. If you go to it, many of the labs, it's world class. So you need human resource. The other one is the infrastructure required. So today it's available in India. The best, maybe uh, comparable to anyone, uh, any, uh, anything in the world. Third thing you need is the industry. Because you know, ultimately, mine to market, uh, lab to land, if it has reached, it has to go through industry. This is, uh, these are the three entities. Then in between, you have the R&D organization like DRDO, where I served for 40 years. And we took technology, spin-off technologies to the people through FIKI, and also through IC Square, and through ATTACK program. So that is, we brought in international cooperation. So the industry, you need three entities. You have academia, R&D organization for translation, and you need industry for commercialization. But then what is the problem in India today, which we need to change, is the connectivity. There is no integration. For example, academia is doing their own uh, research for publication, or to be, become a fellow of an academy, or to be invited for a conference. Now it's changing. There is directed basic research is happening today, which is now bringing a new paradigm to universities, including uh, Amity University, we have brought that culture. It's coming in Amity as a research and innovation driven university. The pedagogy, the method of syllabus, everything in Amity is research and innovation driven. Every, every research we do should lead to either a societal application or to wealth generation in terms of uh, the bringing money to the industry uh, who we transfer the technology. So you need this connectivity. One uh, issue which I thought I should deliberate with you in-house should be that how do we integrate these three players, stakeholders together, academia, R&D organization, uh, and the industry. One way to do it, Madras IIT model, that where we have research and innovation park, that where you have the faculties, researchers, PhD scholars working in that uh, complex. You also have 40 industries in the same building. 
And you have R&D organizations like DRDO. We have taken 30,000 square feet when I was in DRDO. We did that. And ISRO, Atomic Energy, CSIR, and ICR, ICMR, they have taken uh, some. So you have put all the three people together in one ecosystem so that there's a class chart, what is happening, industry knows, what industry needs, the researchers know. So this is how we need to integrate. If we have to become a hub of innovation, India has to become a hub of innovation. You need to have a very close integration of these three. So this is one issue which I thought we should uh, place. How do we do that? We should have enabling mechanisms. We should, have, we should put the enabling policies, practices. We should de deliberate what are those changes, a new paradigm of policies and practices required to integrate these three players is very important. The uh, next thing which I thought I should say is uh, that sci make science career as attractive. Because today, whatever you name, we may not have looked at our pay slip, but today, present generation, when do we get a car, when do we get a house? So you need to make science as an attractive career, not only in terms of money, but in terms of prestige. You have science heroes to be projected like as sports heroes or successful industries, successful uh, the scientists need to be projected as heroes, so that becomes attract the students, best brains to come to science. So this is the next thing we should uh, deliberate is how do we make science as an attractive career. The next thing is the investment in science. Ult ultimately today is not science like C.V. Raman's time or uh, Einstein's time done in single individual thinking as his laboratory. But today you need infrastructure, you need money to do science. So you need critical investment in the country. Today what we have invested is not adequate. Government of India should look at how do we augment, how do we double it, how do we multiply it. It cannot be done by only government. So you need to bring, bring the private sector. This is where, like Amity model, for example, Amity has invested hugely in building infrastructure, in building laboratories, in building special facilities like spintronics, tissue yeah. culture, stem cell banking. So all these new things are happening there. So the Amity is, uh, the private sector is investing. So this should be nurtured, this should be encouraged, promoted. Because government alone cannot do it for 1.2 billion people to invest for such a huge requirement is just not possible. So you need to bring public-private partnership. Because I have been part of the government, now I am part of the private sector. So I, I don't see that cross link. When you look at a private sector, they think, why do I have to give money to the private sector? This should go. It's also a national asset. So I think this government should remove science and technology, DST, DBT, ICM, or ICR should remove this, the barrier, because we also started when I was in DRU, we invested in private sector, private industry. You see 800 private sector industries working with DRU today. So we opened up, we invest facilities, we create facilities in private sector, LNT, Tata's, Mahindra, Mahindra, Reliance. So we did that. This is what is required if you have to bring Use private sector as also a national resource. Don't discriminate when you are looking at investments. The next thing is, uh, I talked about the autonomy. Autonomy is important. Science cannot be done with regimentation, with controls, finance controls, as we have in science ministries. The auditing, pre-audit, post-audit, pre-quotations, L1, all this will, will, will scuttle your, so science needs freedom. So if innovation has to come, give that freedom, autonomy, to the uh, academic research institution with accountability. So this is how we should devolve policy, how do we give that autonomy, but still building the accountability is very important. Public-private partnership, I just mentioned it, but it has to happen in a very big way in our country. Because 0.8 GDP investment in science cannot bring innovation and cannot make uh, India as a cradle of innovation or hub of innovation. So you need to promote private sector in a big way, so bring them in and make policies that will incentivize the private sector to invest in science and innovation. The next thing is uh, research and innovation park, I mentioned the incubators. We need large number of incubators, whether with international cooperation like University of Texas and IC Square or uh, Penn State University. Uh, US is willing to now invest. Uh, in India, in, in research and development, to capacity building for our people. Like for example, I interacted with uh, Mr. Sid Burbank as well as Jim Vance for a long time. They are willing to help us in capacity building because you need human resource who understands the commercialization, who understands the project management. This is the weakness in our educational system in a research institution. They do good science, they, good, uh, they make good publication, but they don't know how to translate them. How do we commercialize that technology? 
This is where we need human resource specifically in project management, we specifically in technology commercialization. This is where international, leveraging international cooperation, what you are talking about, we should. The, the countries which have done Colorado State University, if you go, 60 industries are there in the university campus. 60 industries at the university campus. This is what we should do. Industry should come to academic institution, co-locate themselves, then the innovations will come because mind to market will happen quickly, easily. So we should create ecosystem in such a way that industries are put in academic environments and people are mobil mobility. The academicians should go to industry, industry people should come to academia, they know each other's problem, they talk the same same language. So this is what we should happen, the experience of international agencies, international organizations, we should leverage it to do that. So we need more incubators, venture capitalists, and startups. We should promote. Everybody need not be a scientist, we are looking for an employment. So we should promote how do you become an entrepreneur, create that idea, change that mindset of that boy or a girl who is in the university system, make them dream that they should become a billionaire, they should become a businessman, innovation will come, new startups will come. So, so yeah, just one minute. one minute. Innovation from non-scientists, because there are many scientists who are not in the profession of science, but then they are doing excellent innovation. So we should spot those talents and nurture them. So we should evolve a policy in, in the government. How do you spot those talents outside the scientific fraternity who are doing excellent innovation? Some of them were shown yesterday in the television in one of the solar car. Even today, Pallav Bangla, I was seeing in the television who was talking about a solar car at which Amity University has produced one similarly here. So I think these are things which you should look at. Last point, international cooperation. That's the very important synergy without which you will grow, in incremental growth. But when you bring synergy through international cooperation, it's a force multiplier. So you grow exponentially, you grow logarithmically. This is what we should happen. Like DBT Stanford model, biodesign model is one such very good example. DST Lockheed Martin uh, program is another important thing I saw the, uh, the former C, uh, the C, uh, the chief technical officer. And we bilateral cooperation of DST, DBT, ICMR, they should all harness this internet, liberate the international cooperation in a big, big way, strategic way. We don't have strategy. That is the most important thing. We do many things, yes, we keep doing it. But then now we need to look at what is the strategy by which we bring a change quickly. Because you can't wait for years. It has to be in days and minutes. The innovation happens like that. The other thing you should look at, FICI attack program of DRDO. When it is a good model, which we have succeeded. More than about 50 technologies, some of them have gone global. So FICI, attack, IC square, as well as DRDO together. Now we have commercialized many spin-off technologies, innovation. Otherwise, it would have been in the laboratory. I was fortunate to be instrumental when I was at DRDO to happen this linkage, international cooperation. Similarly, we should also look at uh, the bilateral uh, cooperation. So we can do many things. We should all put our brains together and we should make action plans, roadmap, strategies, and then review those, whether are we doing it correctly, periodic review. Now the government is very vibrant towards this. Minister, you heard the minister talking about it. So the whole ecosystem is geared up. This is the most opportune time that India really make an, uh, can make a difference and we will make a difference. Thank you very much. In, thank you again. Um, our uh, last panelist uh, for, for this afternoon's session is Dr. Vijay Mahajan. Uh, as I said earlier, Dr. Mahajan comes to us from the University of Texas at Austin, and he is both an engineer and a management person. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing his perspective, uh, certainly from the U.S. side, on innovation ecosystem and what India could and should be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the title of this session is uh, Innovation Ecosystem and Indian Perspective. I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to say uh, Innovation Ecosystem and Indian Context. So what I'm going to give you actually who we are. So we don't start talking like Americans. We don't start talking like the Russians. We don't start talking like the Britishers. We have to realize who we are. Uh, this, what I'm going to say, you, tell you, is based on the three books that I have already published on developing countries. Uh, one was 86% solution, naturally, because that's where the world population lives. By solution, I mean, how do we change our mindset? In the United States, our average size of a house is 2,600 square feet now. 
So what we have in the US is 2,600 square feet mindset. Uh, what I teach in the classroom is 2,600 square feet mindset. Buy one, get one free, two cars, three cars. Everybody has a mobile televisions. So I really appreciate my friends here from IC Square when they fly from Austin mm -hmm. to uh, New Delhi. And uh, the, the, they really change, they have to really change their mindset when they <coughs> land here. Let me give you three facts. I live in Austin, Texas. Total GDP of Austin, Texas is $110 billion. <coughs> and metropolitan Austin is less than $2 million. Can you tell me how many states <coughs> in India has an economy bigger than Austin, Texas? Who would like to guess? Okay, one. Two. Three. That's it. No. Karnataka is getting there. Andhra used to be there. But Andhra, uh, what happened there is after the split, they kind of lost that. And Karnataka, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter there is, the fact of the matter there is, there are only three or four states which has economy bigger than Austin, Texas, and you better know that when you talk about any innovation ecosystems. That's number one. Number two, and the minister was absolutely right. He says you better have a next one on agriculture where 80% of the employment is based. Ladies and gentlemen, India is, with the United States, used to be in 1880 when it comes to the urbanization rate. 1880, we are here where the United States was in 1880. Those are the issues we have to deal with, what the minister was saying. How do I take advantage of my rivers? The US did that. How do I take it, create, create an infrastructure? The US did that. How do I deal with my power issues? The US did that. As a matter of fact, there are 3.4 billion people on this planet who are like us. And they're living in the countries where they have the rural population. So let me present you something very interesting, and I hope uh, Fiki would seriously think about that, because it also says that we have to link with uh, international cooperation. International cooperation is not the United States. No offense to my colleagues here. Let me tell you who the international cooperation. We need them, and I'll tell you in a minute why why we need IC Square. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the top 10 countries with the largest rural population, like India, we have the largest rural population on this planet. We have some very unique issues. An ecosystem has to have a context. If you look at the 10 largest countries, or the 10 countries with the largest rural population, seven of them happen to be in Asia, and three of them happen to be in Africa. Africa is Nigeria, Egypt, and Ethiopia. <coughs> And in Asia is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and of course China. Three billion rural consumers live in Africa and uh, the Asia, and one billion of them are around you. Meaning India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. There is only one country, if you really want to understand, the innovation ecosystem, the one company that has figured that out is Unilever. Why? Because they cater to the needs of one, one billion rural consumers in the whole planet. That means almost one billion <coughs> rural consumers in Asia and Africa. When you look at these 10 countries, despite what Chinese says, Chinese are where the United States used to be in 1920. 1920, that's where the Chinese are. And again, when you look at these 10 countries, the, the poorest one is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is where the United States used to be during its civil war, 1860, when that Lincoln was the president. So you got these 10 countries, and they're moving together. Ethiopia, 1860. Then you got China, 1920. 60 years are different. And now the question there is what's going to happen to these people? Collectively, these 10 countries constitute 2.4 billion rural consumers. So 80% of the rural consumers in Asia and Africa live in these 10 countries and led by superpower called India. Ladies and gentlemen, 
India has a major don't kid yourself. China is not going to do it because China wants to beat the hell out of the United States. The only country that can really have an impact on 3.4 billion people on this planet is India. <laughs> really India. So when the minister was giving you an example of the innovation that he would like to see, for example, he mentioned about the, the using the river waters. That's 2.4 billion people. When he was talking about the electric buses, that's 2.4 billion people. When he was talking about renewable energy, that's 2.4 billion people. These 2.4 people don't care a damn that somebody's going to develop a driverless car. Has no meaning to them. <laughs> they come to Austin to test a driverless car. Has no meaning to these people. What has meaning to them there is, do I have electricity? Tell me how can I get it. And when the minister was giving the fact, God bless him, when he said that how much the cost he can reduce, that's the innovation ecosystem that India needs to develop. Do not develop an innovation ecosystem to develop a driverless car. That has nothing to do with economic development. Let me also tell you, India has a long way to go along with these 10 countries. Okay, these 10 countries are moving together. And forget about the BRICS. India has nothing in common with BRICS. Brazil is more urbanized than the United States. They were 83% and they're moving to 91. Brazil had nothing in common with Russia. They're mostly urbanized. So among those four countries, we're left only with India and China. Ladies and gentlemen, take a lead. And one advantage that we have among these 10 countries is that we got the brain power, we have the best scientists. We really have the best scientists. So let's put a flag. International cooperation, get those nine countries here. Let's move it. And we, let's create our own block. Let's not create a, a, a brick bank. We create a bank which really helps this nine, this 10 countries together where 80% of the world rural population lives. And it can be done because we have proved it. We have proved it. Now, why do we need IC squared? Let me tell you why. And the last point I'm gonna make. Why do we need these people? Ladies and gentlemen, it's also so happened the United States has the ninth largest rural population on this planet just because of the size of its population. Ethanol. That's how they diversify their agriculture sector. Okay, so we need that. We need to see what they have done to their rural sector. And it's the lar ninth largest country, and when we have this block of 10 countries together, the United States comes as an observer. And when you go to their rural area, they have the same problem we have. They can't find the physician. Healthcare is poor. No broadband. Schooling is poor. And unemployment. Ladies and gentlemen, let's change the topic of our discussion. <clears throat> let's not talk about the innovation ecosystem that exists in the United States. We don't need it. Let's talk about what Mr. Kelly was saying. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. So it's, it's great, great to hear your perspective. Thank you. Thank you again. We do have some good science heroes. For example, Dr. Abdul Kalam, for example, who was talked about for Brahmos and who was in ISRO earlier. Then he spent a long time in DRU. He became president. A scientist can become president of a country like large country like ours. He can become a Bharat Ratna. See, but those numbers are very small being projected. But there are many heroes who are innovators, in, uh, people who have really been successful, entrepreneurs, startups, and those success stories have, been, have to be celebrated. Celebrate success, that will breed successes. But, but you know, when you open a newspaper, when you open a media, all that what comes is only on bad things which is happening, which happens globally. But then, are we not showing some excitement in science, a new uh, uh, stem cell banking is established somewhere? and also a new treatment modality has come. So these are all successes which are happening every day in our country. Those should be celebrated. Project them as heroes who have done those. So this is what is the message. The media should really bring such glories, such innovators, such incubators. So today I was fortunate to see Balav Bagla standing close to a solar car, which just came a few minutes back. So like this, you have to celebrate. So make them as heroes. So more youngsters will see, I want to be like this. So that is what is the message that society as a whole should have give prestige to science as a career. 
I think, uh, yes, I think the problem is there. Uh, there is a clear recognition that India, the R&D funding really hasn't moved in many years. And of, of that 0.8%, large proportion comes from uh, government, even today, right? And uh, government funding is under stress. Uh, but I think, I think what needs to be done here is, uh, you know, end of the day, we are a democratic country. So government can stand up and say, you know, industry, thou shall invest in R&D. Government just can't do it. I mean, China, maybe they can do it, not, not in India. Uh, so I think uh, industry obviously has to see the value that they get out of it. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a change now. I'm, um, maybe the change needs to be accelerated. I mean, for example, I can give our own example, Reliance Industries. <coughs> we have invested substantially in last uh, few years in R&D, creating our own R&D infrastructure. I mean, it's still smaller than what a comparable company would have outside, but it is getting there. <coughs> End of the day, I think the problem is on both sides. I don't think we could sit here and say that the problem is with the industry. When we, I have, we have had collaborations with academia where academia has not delivered. So once you, once you get beaten by it, you say, hey, I'm not going to take my risk. So I think, I think both sides have to recognize and I don't think it's the government can do. I mean, government can say, okay, you do CSR, you do space sector, but that's not the solution. Solution is both sides have to have see value. And one of the things under FIKI we have tried to do is to also you know, incentivize the Indus Indian academia. And in, in a democracy, in incentivization is what works. Uh, stick doesn't work usually, right? Uh, so the academia should also get incentivized to work with the industry. So, and this is a long process. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think I, I, I'm seeing a change. May I just short, yeah, give a short sure. intervention? Uh, see, the government is now trying to in invest more in science. They are making all efforts. Uh, the, the first thing is, a, a day before yesterday, I talked to Secretary DST. Uh, she was telling that 4,000 crores is their budget, and 10% increase this year. So I don't know about ICMR, but certainly there's a 10% increase in DST. Similarly for TDB, we have schemes for entrepreneurship development uh, oriented program. DST has got uh, uh, the TDB, Technology Development Board. Then we have in BIRAC program in deep, uh, uh, then we have Gita. And number of initiatives are coming, so it will happen. TIFAC, TIFAC. So I think uh, the entrepreneurship development is being looked at in a very positive way. Startups, government is going to invest huge, huge amount for, uh, I think how much? Uh, thousand uh, crores. Thousand I think crores. Yeah, so dollar. that's a huge money. So it will happen. Because you know the kitty in our treasury is also not much. So that's one reason. But the private sector, we should create, encourage, promote, incentivize private sector including industry. For example, Reliance, it's very strong R&D centers. You have Cartridge, uh, l &T. They are doing not only in strategic sector, they are coming in on the non-strategic sector. And I think these are the things, industry wants and comes in. The government has kept a target of 2% GDP to grow, but that is not only by government investment, but it is through promoting, incentivizing, making policies for the private sector. Thank yeah. you. As only if they say there's a business model behind it. Right. Otherwise, you can keep on talking and it won't happen. But as Professor Margin so eloquently showed, that there's a huge market out there. Um, the late uh, Professor C.K. Prahlad, of course, read the famous, famous book on the, the last four billion. That's the market, and India's innovation can be the leaders in terms of goods and services for that last mile, for the BOP, for this huge population that has been described. Other corporates are coming to India and setting up disruptive innovation centers. Why can't the Indian corporates do that? And I think some of them are already looking towards that. For FIKI and the Millennium Alliance, working with the DST and the various international collaborators that I mentioned at the start, are looking to capture much of these innovations and bring them to scale. As we've heard also in the opening session, a lot of the ideas, not many really stick off. And that's what we're trying to do, crowdsource, recognize, and, and scale up. And clearly we are seeing a huge corporate play in this area. And I think uh, we need to work more closely. It's not enough to say CSR. The, the Niti Ayoga suggested that CSR funds be used for impact investing. For that, you need to change the corporate law. If that can be changed, then FIKI's Millennium Alliance is looking to now work with financial institutions and impact investors that can take these models to scale thereafter. Okay, thank you. Five lakhs graduates are unemployed, including science graduates, 
commerce and humanities, more than 45 lakhs unemployed graduates in Delhi only. So, sir, what is the effectiveness of ecosystem for un un unemployed graduates? Okay, so there's two questions. One was about Mr. Abdul, Dr. Abdul Kalam, right? And that, I, I guess. Yeah, so I, I think we got the questions. Yeah. I, 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 let me answer to you. Uh, we have uh, celebrated Dr. Kalam birthday, and uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India has come and uh, inaugurated a museum dedicated in the memory of Dr. Kalam at DRDO. And uh, it is uh, because it is within the Secure, secured uh, campus, so you can uh, suddenly come and visit uh, by taking appointment from the RDU, number one. Number two, we do have a, uh, a museum uh, dedicated to Dr. Kalam in the premises of Brahmos Aerospace and uh, we are uh, custodian of uh, all the medals, souvenirs, honors and uh, various uh, memorabilia given to him uh, during what his uh, lifetime. Question? And uh, you can uh, visit our website and uh, we are going to put up a, a virtual uh, tour of the museum also shortly, within about 10-15 days it should be alive. And uh, if you are interested, you just send us an uh, email and uh, we would uh, ensure that you are conducted. For your information, uh, every Saturday and Sunday, uh, students who are in school or college mostly who are in school, they do visit our museum and uh, we provide them uh, a almost three and four hours of conducted visit. And uh, in future, although the, both the museums are uh, located in a secured area, and uh, that is why we are asking you to take appointment, but soon, maybe within one year, we would come out with a museum which would be open to public almost uh, during all the weekdays. Thank you. And I guess the biggest uh, remembrance of Dr. Kalam is all when the Brahmos missiles fly back and forth. I think that's that's the, I mean, to me, that's the greatest remembrance of him. Uh, in fact, uh, Brahmos is uh, one, uh, you can say, one uh, of his uh, research uh, result. Uh, there are hundreds of things which Dr. Kalam has come out. And uh, if you visit museum, we will certainly would be able to tell you. They don't have skills. So that is where the first thing which government is doing is to have a focus on skill development where even private sector is involved now. For example, Amity, we have started uh, diploma courses, we have started certificate courses where you can... Right, so uh, we will give them that competence. Yeah. Excuse me, I don't think we want to get into a social debate here. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have the competency building as well as the skill development. This will lead to the additional advantage, skill being given to the individual, vocational training. That will add value to this individual who will be able to be deployed. Then the entrepreneurship development and startups so that you become yourself self-employed instead of looking into an employment elsewhere, either in the government. So I think the industries, once it grows, job opportunities come, more innovation, more industries and more employment. Okay. Very relevant discussion. As a matter of fact, we probably sh you should have probably asked this question first. Uh, I think that I, I, I pushed him back. <laughs> I know you did. I know you did. Uh, you're not going to find a solution from the bureaucrats. You have to find a solution from the people who are going to make money out of this. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at really the private sector uh, who don't want to miss out their opportunity. And trust me, they're way ahead of us in the ecosystems because their ecosystem has to move fast. It has to be agile, it has to be cost effective, and results oriented. So who are these companies other than the Chinese? So if you have time, I can give you some examples of the Chinese, what they have done. And there's a lot of government intervention there, along with the private sector. In this country, uh, the, the, I would say that the, among, after interviewing all these uh, companies and all that, the two people who have really understood how to develop that ecosystem is the Airtel, Bharti, and the second, part, uh, the multinational who have understood that is Unilever. Mm -hmm. Also keep in mind that Unilever actually Pakistan and Bangladesh report to India. So they had an even more complicated problem because they have to also deal with the religious aspects. Okay? So they have really created an ecosystem that will be amazed. And if we have time, we can even talk about how they have used the mobile technology also these days. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thing I said is about the Chinese. Now, China is really amazing because Chinese have been able to reduce their poverty level 
And if you see that graph, my God, it's shocking to see how they have reduced property level. And by the way, it was not magic. I mean, th there were targets, and there was no debate. This needs to be done, and this is how we're going to do it. Okay? What is the best use they did? Cyber villages. I would really urge you to look at what they did with the cyber villages. And those cyber villages then were actually really helped by Taibo, you know, all these entrepreneurs who have created these companies. So they really literally linked 48% of the rural population to the, the main platform where the country wants to go. So let me stop there. There is a way to actually develop this country, and exactly what the minister was saying. It basically requires a focus. It really requires a focus, but if you're all over the place, you won't get it. This discussion about the ecosystem is going everywhere. They should have been very focused that we, like the minister said, focus on agriculture, focus on where 80% of the people in this country have jobs are dependent on. Not Mumbai, not Reliance. No offense to you. Sir, can I add to that? Okay, uh, great. Should go home and okay. I think I think um, we we are uh, we have to conclude the session. I know there are a lot more questions, but uh, the speakers panelists would be available during lunch break, and feel free to uh, reach out to them. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for a wonderful session. Uh, I think we got very very differing perspective, very wide ranging perspective, and uh, it's really been educational for at least for me personally. So thank you once again, and thank you to the audience. Sorry we, we ran over into your lunch, but, uh, but I, I think it was fun. So it's I request it. you to wait a bit further. Uh, Dr. Malkaran Fadke, thank you very much for chairing this uh, vibrating session. And I think, you know, it has kept Mishra to Professor Mahajan, Mahajan. to Dr. Yeah, Selva Murthy. Mr. Anil Sinha would request <laughs> Professor Mahajan to present the way. Professor Mahajan would request you to present the token of respect to uh, Dr. Makrant Fadke, please. Oh, oh, give me a hug. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> we can't let him out. <laughs> Thank you. We had fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Request you to join for the lunch, please. Yeah. development and startups so that you become yourself self-employed. China is really amazing because Chinese have been able to reduce their poverty level. There are hundreds of things which Dr. Kalam has come out with.